<clears throat> Will we see the chat stream? Uh, you should be able to see the chat stream on the right. Hello, everyone. This is uh, John Haller. Um, and if somebody would just in chat, give me a thumbs up to make sure that you're you're hearing us and that type of thing. We would really, uh, well, I would really appreciate it. In fact, I can hear myself talking in the background now anyway, so I'm going to shut that down so we do this. So listen, everybody, welcome to a Proxy Roundtable. Tonight, I have uh, three great guests with me, uh, Patrick Wood, uh, Britt Gillette, and Scott Townsend. And we're going to talk about technology, AI, market the beast, financial markets, things that are going on in this particular sector, because we do think this is relevant to Bible prophecy in many respects. Now, if you've not listened to one of our Prophecy Roundtables before, uh, I want you to be forewarned that you may hear some things tonight that are on a human level, very scare, scary, disturbing, concerning. We have to remember, though, that the Lord is in control, that nothing is escaping his gaze, that he is allowing these things to happen, and that we should really be excited that we're privileged to live at a time like this. If you remember when Jesus came at his first coming, he did at one point talk to his disciples and say, guys, the prophets long to live at the time that you're living at. And I think that if uh, my understanding of the way the Jewish scriptures work, uh, pattern is prophecy. And so what happened at Jesus' first coming is relevant in the pattern for what will be happening as we lead up to his second coming. And I think that we should also consider ourselves blessed that we live at this time. But I will confess to you, I'm one that's been watching this. I know Scott and Patrick and Britt have also been watching this for many, many years. And it can be very dis disconcerting at times. Uh, it can be rather overwhelming. But we also hope to give you some practical advice about navigating the world in which we live right now. So we're going to start. Uh, I want also, if we're talking about prophecy as pattern, I'd like to just start and remind people of the Tower of Babel. And remember at the Tower of Babel, people were trying to build a tower to the heavens and they were really trying to become as gods uh, or as god and i think we're seeing that right now i mean i could play for you clip after clip and we're not going to do that tonight you'll see some of those in some of my upcoming prophecy updates but there are some very concerning things that we see going on so i'm going to let scott lead off so scott where where do you want to start our discussion tonight well, first of all, uh, thank you for putting this roundtable together, John. And I just to underscore uh, for those that are listening, both live and also afterwards uh, picking it up, I do encourage everyone to like, share, uh, subscribe, and to make sure that this gets out there. And as they famously say, the algorithms matter. And so we need your help uh, to minister to other uh, people in the body of Christ that are not fully present with us right at this moment. So I'd appreciate that. And so would everyone here. Look, these uh, topics are uh, complex and technical. This is the technology roundtable. So uh, we're going to get uh, a lot of information. And I think what uh, the four of us have a purpose to do in our hearts is to both explain what's happening in the uh, technology sector as we see it uh, you know, converging and supporting what we know is coming from Bible prophecy perspective and a biblical worldview, but at the same time, not make the assumption that everyone has been following it all for the last years. And so we're gonna try to balance, and this is gonna be hard, honestly, we're gonna try to balance uh, feeding those that are uh, really current with this, as well as those that are just coming up to speed or suspect, feel in their heart and spirit that something's not right with the world but they really don't have any formal background yet on what is happening in the world. So with that said, uh, John, if you don't mind, I think we should dive right into AI. Go for it. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll begin with AI and a number of other topics, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to discuss tonight is this idea that AI, and you've heard 
each of us individually in our respective uh, conversations that we've had talking about the acceleration of AI. Now, all of the technology is increasing and you know the uh, amount of progress that is being made is just mind blowing to me as a tech guy. So I, when I heard the news information a couple of weeks ago about Grok, G-R-O-Q, Grok is a AI, a new AI startup and a model that is uh, specifically tuned to do very, very fast uh, responses to prompting to questions. What makes this very, very important is that uh, in the process of talking to an AI large language model, such as ChatGPT and Claude and others like that, Gemini from Google, and Microsoft has all of their versions. The explosion of these uh, models right now is uh, truly breathtaking. But just pausing for a second on Grok, what they did is they created a new form of chip that helps drive conversations. It's natural language processing. And this will be part of the new wave of innovation that we're gonna see very soon. And the reason why I'm, I want to bring this up is from a Bible prophecy point of view, when we see AI being able to respond with the fluidity and with the speed and vocabulary competency of another human being, that should cause us to have pause because we're already hearing examples of people getting phone calls and they can't, it sounds like it's from their kid or from somebody that they know asking for money and potentially this is a, a fraud situation and the ability for AI to impersonate and to react fast enough in order to have basically full blown coherent conversations with people is pretty amazing. And from a Bible prophecy point of view, this would fall under the deception narrative of what we're seeing in the world today. And I'll just pause right there, but Britt, uh, just toss to you right now, you know, Grok and the ability to impersonate both visually and with 3D models speaking with your own voice, looking like you and speaking with the lips moving with your voice. That is a pretty amazing thing. And it's sobering to say the least. Yes, I think so. I think it, when you look at, we're, we're really blurring the lines of being able to tell what's real and what's not. As you said, this ability to mimic people, impersonate people over the phone, maybe even over a Zoom or, or something of that nature. And so again, this, this type of deception is rampant everywhere. And that's why it's very important to be grounded in the word of God, because that's our source of truth. We're going to find that you know, search engines and chatbots, all of these things, we already find that all of these things are slanted in a certain way. They're really representations of fallen mankind. So we're not going to get biblical truth from these types of systems, <clears throat> but we're inundated with this type of media all day long. And if you aren't careful, if you aren't studying the word of God on a regular basis every single day, you're going to really find yourself not just deceived, but sort of brought down um, into just a, a depressing world, so to speak, and it, and it brought down into the ways of the world. And so it's very important to uh, study the word of God, be focused on that, because these, these technologies, again, what, what happens when we have, say, an upcoming election, and we say, oh, well, here's this conversation that happened over on the side when nobody was looking. Can you believe this candidate said that? And it could be a complete fabrication. Mm -hmm. We could have wars start over fabricated video or audio that's supposedly a world leader saying something or doing something that didn't actually happen. So this is, you know, really unprecedented area that we're going into where, I mean, we've seen how quickly, how 
viral something can spread over the internet. And when you have something that's completely counterfeit spread at that rate, well, how do you deal with that? How do you react to that? Yeah, that's uh, it's a it's a very difficult thing. Patrick, what are your initial thoughts here tonight? I think we part of the part of me wants to to speak to the magnitude of what we're talking about here. This is not just um, about people losing touch with reality. That's one thing, but it's going to affect and is already affecting every area of society, whether it's uh, economics, uh, jobs, um, banking, insurance, you name it, everything is going through this uh, change right now. Somebody likened it to the discovery of electricity. When, uh, of course, it took a long time before anybody knew what to do with it. <laughs> but nevertheless, that was uh, earth shaking for sure. Um, except now what we're seeing is a, an acceleration of the discovery process on what electricity meant to people and where, where we, what we could do with it. This time frame has been collapsed in a period, uh, well, at least 18 months now, as far as the public is concerned. And, uh, this is causing all sor sorts of uh, dislocations, uh, people's brains just being scrambled by it. Most people on the street get lit glimpses of it, but that's about, up, about all. So when we look at the big picture, um, the world is going through this process of 52 card pickup, literally, I, that, that's my opinion in any case. Where it, go, where it goes and where it ends, where all the cards will end in the end, will of course it'll be on the floor, but <laughs> they're, they're gonna be very difficult to pick up again. And nobody is really sure where this, this is going. We know intuitively it's, it's bad. It's not gonna be good. Uh, it might be good for s some things, maybe, you know, if you're gonna get a, a heart transplant or something that might be, you know, useful there, but otherwise it's gonna be very bad for society. And we have never experienced, all of us, all of us, every one of us has not experienced what, what we're about to get into just no, there's no way to predict exactly what's going to look like down the road. I can guarantee you, however, however, it's going to be different and it's going to be uh, earth shaking. It's like, uh, you know, if your house burns down, your city uh, gets destroyed like an earthquake or whatever, uh, a, 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 a tidal wave, you know, takes over the, the, the coast. Uh, this is going to be that kind of magnitude for a lot of people, if not all society. So anyway, that's just an opening thought. When you mention, um, melding voices to people and making them look like they're saying something else, I don't know if you guys saw when NVIDIA, and we'll probably mention NVIDIA a few times times you know it started out as a a chip company for graphics processing for gamers and that in and video and that sort of thing and now it's sort of provide well it's that sort of it is providing a large portion of the backbone for the ai processing that needs to be done in these massive server farms and data centers and that sort of thing but when they rolled out some of their technology last year, they, they had Jason Wang, the founder and CEO of NVIDIA, and he was speaking, but it was like, you, you couldn't tell the different, it, it was in different languages. And you, you couldn't tell that it was not him. It had his voice and vocal intonation 
and everything. And it sounded like he was speaking Korean or Japanese or Chinese. And it, it was very disconcerting. And I agree with you. I mean, we're entering into an election season where I don't think we've seen anything. I'm, I'm not optimistic as to how this is going to go. I think we're going to see a lot of very strange, odd things uh, in the near term. Um, so let's so let, let's go back, Scott. Let, let's get back into the AI part because that seems to be sure. one of the main hot topics. But then we also need it's to go very into hot. financial markets and all yeah. the other – because everything is interrelated now. And I, I agree with you. Uh, you made an excellent point that we are uh, – it's, it's not going to affect everything or every area of our life. It already is. We probably just don't know it. But I do not know of a company, a law firm, a corporation, or anything that is not integrating AI into any, anywhere from small to major parts of what they're doing. So take it away. So I would like to, uh, you know, just add a snippet to what Patrick was saying about we don't know where this is all going. And I think that that's true. I think we would all agree to that. But I, I think let's make a distinction because I think our audience knows where this is going. It's going towards this choke point in Revelation 13 and the mark of the beast and all of the technologies that we can imagine are necessary in order to create complete control. And uh, that's, I just wanted to make a comment that there's this duality there. One is we really don't know what it's gonna look like, but on the other hand, biblically, we know where this is going to terminate and uh, the consequences for humanity is very dire. The, the second uh, topic, John, that I'd like to uh, talk about is also very, uh, interesting and somewhat scary because this invokes the Terminator movie franchise where you see the robot powered by an AI chip and there's time travel and there's a lot of Hollywood. This is the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, movies that came out a number of years ago. But we have said in previous interviews that it's one thing for AI to exist in the context of a chip and in a server in a data center. It's in a data rack. That rack holds multiple servers and it's contained, physically contained. And now we have always been kind of aware that if AI gets out into the physical world, listen everyone, when AI gets into the physical world, that is a whole new deal. Mm -hmm. And we are there. So you see Tesla creating robots and they've got their AI. You see uh, a company that a lot of these uh, robot companies are getting massive amounts of revenue or uh, investment right now. I think there's one called Figure. Is that right, Britt? I'm not that familiar does, with Figure. Yeah, general purpose uh, robots that are interacting in a lab experiment. Okay, so they're still contained in a laboratory, but they are autonomous, they are thinking, they're not wired, they're not controlled by some guy in the background behind the curtain with a joystick. We're way, way beyond that now. And one of the scenes that I saw not too long ago was uh, the robot was being questioned in front of a a uh, sink with dishes and different objects in it. And the robot was being asked to identify everything. And then it handled the plate and then put it in the, the drain area where the plate stand and it was stacking the plates. Also it handed the, uh, the person, the real person, an apple on request. And so I think, you know, one of the things we have to be aware of is that we may not see this actually coming out into uh, commercial use right now, but I think uh, all of us agree that from a military point of view, especially with regard to drones and autonomous flights, 
uh, with high level and very technical solutions uh, from the air. That could be a very big reality. And, and Britt, I think your your uh, you know discussion about drone swarms and molecular engineering. I just have to applaud uh, the way that you characterize that because I think you're dead on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you want me to expound upon that for people that Certainly. may not have heard, when we see, you know, what's going on in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, what we've seen is that the conventional military weapons post World War II are completely dominated by drones, and we're really in the rudimentary initial stages of drone warfare. Here we're talking about first person view where somebody is controlling this from some distance and still they're able to take out tanks and armored personnel carriers and really just transform the battlefield. But this is only going to get more sophisticated as time goes by. And this is where AI comes in and that it can control multiple drones acting in a swarm. And as these get more sophisticated, smaller, uh, more efficient, what we're really going to see is, is swarms along the line of a swarm of bees, where you have thousands of drones moving in tandem, and they're decentralized. So if you took out one or more, the others continue to come, and there's really no uh, defensive measures that have been developed against this. I've heard people talk about where well, you could use uh, electromagnetic pulse, but then the question is, well, by what range? Do you just fire this indiscriminately? Do you do it up to you know a couple hundred yards, 50 yards, whatever it is? But those swarms can react to that. They can learn from that. They can learn what the defensive capabilities are and they can attack from multiple directions. Heard about lasers is one that people are throwing out. But again, when you've got, let's say you got 10,000 bees, you have 10,000 lasers to direct at each individual bee. I mean, there's the defensive capabilities are not going to keep up with this. And so we're seeing these drones pro proliferate on the battlefield. We've seen how in the Red Sea, the United States conventional naval deterrent is gone. So since World War II, the United States has been able to protect the world's waterways, make them freely navigable for international trade. The United States and its allies have been completely shut out of the Red Sea by some rebels in Yemen with drones. Those drones are going to get more sophisticated as time goes by. They're being shot down with million-dollar missiles this can't continue on. So new capabilities have to be developed to deal with those. And here, John's put a picture up on the screen of really what's coming, and it's just going to get more and more sophisticated. And where this is going next is, you know, nations are recognizing that, well, to build an aircraft carrier like the one we see on the screen takes years and billions of dollars and this long program and a lot of the technology becomes obsolete before it becomes reality. But if you can build these drones that we see going after the aircraft carrier, you really want to pour your investment into the AI and the systems to control those. And then you want to man manufacture these drones as cheaply as you can, deploy as many as you can, create methods to be able to create these on the battlefield where they're going to be used and deploy them. And that's where molecular manufacturing comes in, because that will enable nations to bring this technology to scale very rapidly. So back in August, the United States Department of Defense uh, announced that they were pursuing something called the Replicator Initiative, which was to deploy thousands of air, land, and sea-based drones simultaneously for a possible attack on an adversary. So they already recognize this. Again, the nations recognize this. This is what they're going toward. And really what's going to unleash that potential is molecular manufacturing. You could liken that to say a race, the race toward the atomic bomb in World War II. Whoever achieves that ability 
in tandem with artificial intelligence, will really have the ability to conquer the entire world. And back in 2017, Vladimir Putin was addressing some students in Russia, and he said, and it was in regard to artificial intelligence, and he said, whoever is the leader in this field will be ruler of the world. He understands it. All the other nations' leaders understand it. There's a race on, and whoever achieves this is going to conquer the world. So I don't know what, maybe you have some thoughts on that, Patrick. I think you're on mute. Oh, I, you want to talk about the role of the military in the first place to develop much of this technology for the sake of um, fighting wars. They've been at the forefront, for, forefront o over the years of just about everything we, we talk about today. Um, their role, if, if, it, if, if they had not been there, put it this way, uh, we would not be where we are today. I don't believe so. Um, organizations like DARPA and uh, China has their their counterpart. So does Russia, uh, Germany, France, you, England, whatever. Uh, you have these very dark uh, organizations who have been pursuing this concept of a super band uh, over the years. That started with Hitler, by the way, the idea of a superman. But the military talks openly about creating supermen to fight the battles. They will be augmented with uh, uh, skeletons, AI, amazing weapons, whatever. But the idea is to create um, a, uh, a machine slash human, uh, not a robot, but you know, whatever, uh, a cyborg that can fight the battles, but they're not fighting against people necessarily. They, the citizens of the company, the country, they're they're fighting against each other. <laughs> this doesn't, this is does not bode well for um, warfare. And in, in the military today, we see just like in society, everything is being transformed right now by AI. Every, there's not one single system in the mili military that has not been changed majorly whether it's uh, spy sa satellites, um, air aircraft, uh, weapons, drones on the crown, drones in the, in the air, um, you name it, uh, the selective targeting um, by using AI. They've, they've glommed onto this stuff well, they probably created most of it, but you know they they've got now this in their portfolio of tricks, and there's no end to it now because we can't stop the military. There's no way you can stop these people because they're not elected, they're not uh, uh, accountable to anybody. That's what what Eisenhower <laughs> warned us about in 1955. Nobody really listened to him apparently, but. Um, you know, the military has been a very bad actor in this whole thing. And that's kind of separate from what we're dealing with over here with society with e economics, uh, you know, personal issues, et cetera, loss of jobs. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really sweeping everything. But the military needs to have some accountability here, I think. Yeah, what's interesting to me is that uh, there's this notion of a mesh, M-E-S-H, mesh network. Mm -hmm. And these satellite systems yeah. that uh, Elon Musk has put up with Starlink, as well as Bezos and his stuff, these are the low Earth orbit uh, satellites. They're like a grid. I mean, you can think of it like the Borg, you know, from Star Trek days. Yeah. Sorry for the uh, dated reference there. But they had a hive mind. And I think that's what Britt is talking about when he talks about these robot swarms, 
How do you control a swarm? Well, there's a, a mesh or a uh, hive mentality that they have where they get uh, instructions and then they go carry it out autonomously. It's really <laughs> amazing. It makes it very, very difficult to defeat when, you know, they could just splinter off and, you know, go into separate swarms and divide and then re regather again in order to pursue whatever the target is that they're after. But, uh, but I think we should pay, pay attention to the term mesh and hive when it comes to network communications, because I think that is pivotal to uh, empowering the, what we see with digital currencies coming up, mobile phone and its capability to do digital wallets. And we're going to get over into the financial part in just a bit. But I, I think that it's worth noting that these satellites are up there now. I like Mondo Gonzalez uh, at Prophecy Watchers. I'm also a amateur uh, astrophotographer. And just last night I was imaging M13, also known as the Hercules cluster. And right when I'm looking at you know, my iPad with the data coming in, the picture, I saw a big streak of some, uh, you know, satellite going through it. So, no, well, wait a minute, Scott, what's Hercules 13? So, uh, is uh, Messier 13 is one of the star clusters and okay. it was named the Hercules star cluster because it's uh, one of the biggest that they know about. So millions yeah. of light years away, okay. millions of light years wide. I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of stars in it. It looks like a globular cluster. So very cool object to photograph. A little bit different than the eclipse uh, a couple of days ago. But uh, yeah, anyway, I think that, uh, you know, this mesh network is something that the Watchman community should pay attention to. And I do have some application points, if you don't mind, uh, sure. John, that I'd like to talk about. Uh, I don't know that we're going to see the Terminator uh, before the rapture. And I don't even think we're going to see it afterwards. I think the Lord will, in my opinion, just me thinking out loud. I don't know that there's time to develop all of that stuff completely to its fullest as the way the way that Hollywood has primed us and stage set at this whole deal. I think the Lord will interrupt some of this. Um, and just a couple tips because this is important when we talk about impersonation scams and other uh, things like that. Impersonation is going to be a bigger deal. Hacking will be a bigger deal. We haven't talked about QSTAR and its ability to break encryption yet. Quantum computers and how it can also break encryption. That'll come maybe in another show, but be very careful. So here's some advice to our community here. Be very careful of any AI powered device or software, okay? Uh, especially those that are listening to you. And here I'm talking about Amazon, Alexa, and all of the smart devices, Siri, and all of their uh, variations. Anything that is able to hear your voice when you're in a car and you command the car to do something for you, those are things that we need to pay attention to and just ask yourself the question. I'm not saying don't use it and don't take a pair of pliers and yank that device out of your car. I'm not saying that. What I do think we need to do is to be wise about how much exposure to these intelligent devices are we going to allow. Part of the reason why I went back to an analog watch was because I was uncomfortable with how you know, intimate that Apple watch was, you know, I didn't want that anymore in my life. So I just made some adjustments there. And I think we have to pay attention. Also, By the way, we should, we should make a clarification here that your wife telling you that the light is green is not something that's not an AI thing that we need to get rid of. <laughs> I saw a very cute video today about the guy saying like, I, I didn't know how to drive until I got my wife in the car with me, uh, apparently. So, um, yeah. but I'm just, I'm trying Funny. to make a little bit of a humorous comment here, Yeah. but I, I think Scott, you're, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but you're exactly right. Is that it's very difficult to know where to go with this. I have been inundated as an attorney It's kind of a semi-retired attorney now, um, 
my, for example, for, for weeks and months, my Twitter feed was full of about 30 tweets a day telling me about this AI or that AI. And then there's one that's really directed to an attorneys, to attorneys. And I think there's some concern in the attorney field that a lot of attorneys are going to go away because these AI things are going to come in and be able to do the basic construction of contracts and leases and agreements and that sort of thing. And maybe you'll have a live person review them. At least that's the hope that, you know, there will still be, you'll need to have a live lawyer that's making money. But a lot of people are saying that 90% of transactional attorneys could probably be replaced in very short order by these things. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but the, it's, there's so much marketing and hype and everything going on. It, you can't avoid it at this point. Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. I just one more piece, uh, John. Thank you. Uh, is when it comes to being uh, alert, I think uh, one of the things I'd like to encourage everyone is make sure that you're following best practices for antivirus software. When you are about to, to respond to a text message, be very careful of where that's coming from. And you can hover over, if you're on a computer, hover over a link to see what that URL is leading you to. I'm getting many, many more, you know, uh, phishing attempts that are directing me to a, a, a some kind of a website that has a payload of bad things in it. You have to be very smart nowadays. If there's any doubt, I never click on a link to a vendor that I do business with. So if Bank of America you know, does something or if any other vendor does it, I see the email and I see what it says but I actually log in to the bank directly. I do not use a link that comes through email or a text message. I hope that makes sense. So let's be wise about that. For those in the older generation, and I am among them, uh, you know, let's get our kids to help us. <laughs> I laugh. But the younger generation, they're much more discerning and sophisticated about uh, these things. Do not be afraid, intimidated, or fearful that you'll look silly or that you're asking too much of your kids or trusted friends. And I would recommend that, uh, that you take advantage of getting a second set of eyes on whatever it is that looks suspicious to you because the amount of deception is going to be overwhelming. Yeah, so um, I, I guess, um, well, uh, Scott, you, you had prepared an outline for us. So if you want to move on to the next topic, um, well, well I think, uh, let, Brett, let me ask this. Let, 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 let me back up just a second because, Brett, I think this is something that you can address because I think we may have talked about this previously. For example, a lot of people, you know, that follow Bible prophecy or big supporters of Israel. And we're seeing a lot of things going on with Israel and the Houthis with relatively inexpensive drones are winning an economic war. You know, a $400 drone has to be shot down by a, a one or $2 million missile. That's not a sustainable thing that anyone can do. Uh, and, and why can't, why can't somebody just devise something to deal with a drone swarm? I think when we talked about this recently on another round table, somebody said, well, you know, Russia will just, or somebody will just devise a thing that can uh, essentially do an EMP attack on, on the electrical and brain systems of the drones. What's your response to that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, when you think of that, you have to direct it somewhere in some direction. And, it, and again, it has to have some sort of range. So let's say there's an approaching drone swarm and you want to fire this electromagnetic pulse. Well, again, what's your range on that? Because you might hit some of your own infrastructure, things that you don't want to damage in addition to those drones. But then again, you would have to fire it from, let's say you're a tank. You have to cover all around you, <laughs> every side above you. 
because you don't know what direction those drones may be coming from. There may be some coming from one way. And that's where we get into what I was talking about with AI on board these swarms. It's going to be learning what those defensive measures are. So even if you develop a defensive measure that works today, tomorrow it may not work because it's going to learn the range of that electromagnetic pulse. And it may say, let's stop outside of that range and fire something that is immune to the EMP from that point, or let's break apart <laughs> and go, as Scott was saying, and come from different directions, multiple swarms. So again, there's there really aren't weapons. Again, this is why we see on the battlefield in Ukraine right now that drones are dominating conventional weapon systems because there aren't adequate defenses put in place for that. It's easy to try to imagine those, but it's another practice to actually get them onto the battlefield. And again, those defensive measures are going to have to grow exponentially along with the drone technology and swarm technology, which is growing exponentially. So even if you develop a defense, you're going to have to continuously do that and you're always going to be playing catch up. So that favors offensive weapons. And that's why I said whoever is able to devise a manufacturing process that enables the deployment of billions or trillions of drones at scale, at low cost, is going to have an insurmountable advantage. and They'll just dominate the battlefield. Yeah, to the point on the EMP, uh, which, you know, classically today could short out a bunch of electronics. Uh, one of the, the things that I've been watching here is organoid intelligence, which is a form of a brain computer interface without a human brain. So what they do is they take brain cells, a group of them, and they can train those cells. For example, I saw a paper on 300,000 or so of these brain cells playing Pong, the old, you know, video game, one of the original OG video games. And to this point, you can have a drone body made out of composites that doesn't show up. No electrical, you know, thing could affect that. It's not made out of metal, which is what EMPs act on. If you don't have a chip in it because you have an organic brain in it that's been programmed, there you go. I mean, there is an, an uh, just a, a very, very sophisticated way of getting around a lot of these EMP type uh, deterrents, if you will. I also think that, uh, you know, we talk about terms of iron beam or something like that, the laser system to shoot things down but if you have twenty thousand drones you need twenty thousand beams that aren't going to interfere with each other as they try to shoot down these drones i mean you know the the laser systems operate on a straight shot deal and it takes them a little they have to be locked onto a target for a while at least the technology that we have so far and they have to be very close to the technology so you can't have twenty thousand lasers shooting at twenty thousand drones flying all over the sp all over the place. It would seem like you're you're going to have problems. So it, it's it's a big problem. And what it does is it's shifting warfare. Uh, one of you mentioned Putin. Uh, it was Brit, I think. I want to show you a, a slide that I just picked up today. Uh, hang on a second here. I've got a. Um, here is a, this is Alexander Dugan. He is uh, often referred to as Putin's brain. So Putin, look, Putin's very developed in this technology. And I think we're at a stage too. We may see some of these drone swarm, missile swarm things happening in the next 24, 48, 72 hours. But, you know, this was interesting. This just came across my Twitter feed today. Putin's ideolo ideologist, Dugan, Alexander Dugan, 
he's kind of this strange mystical guy, very pro Russian, very pro uh, Eurasian, and they're going to dominate the world. We're the best Christians in the world. And he says, this Jerusalem will be a Russian city or it will not exist at all. Now, that's a very interesting statement that he makes. You know, we, we talk a lot about Russia with Ezekiel 38, 39. And um, Putin's stated objective in Ukraine is to protect ethnic Russians. And what do we have in the north of Israel? Uh, one to two million Russian-speaking Jews who immigrated from Russia. So I don't know if that's going to have anything to do with it, but you put drone technology in the hands of a guy like this and it becomes a very interesting thing i mean when we talk about ezekiel 38 uh verse 9 i think it is you come up like a cloud against the land and was that some kind of vision that john that ezekiel was having about a future drone attack so Patrick, I want to take just a little bit of time, though, because this is your area of expertise. I've known Patrick for quite a while now. And um, Patrick, you know, you've written the book, uh, what is it, The Evil Twins of Technocracy and Transhumanism? Correct. Uh, and you've been studying transhumanism for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, I'm going to put up a picture here of... Uh, I think one of your, uh, the people you think is most important here in, uh -oh. um, in uh, uh, technocracy, um, the infamous uh, Zbigniew of Brzezinski. Okay. okay. Yeah. And that, you know what? I think that that, based on what you've written about him, I think that that picture yeah. captures okay. the ev evidence of the essence of Zbigniew of Brzezinski, maybe more so than any picture of any human being I've ever seen. But exactly. tell us, talk a little bit about the technocracy, transhumanism development. If you could just kind of put it into a, I don't know, five minute or so summary as to how, how did we get here? And, and what, are, what are we missing? And how do you see all of that, the historical development manifesting itself in what we're seeing in the tech field today? Well, you have to go back to the beginning when the, the uh, Trilateral Commission was formed in 1973 by Brzezinski and David Rockefeller. Uh, Brzezinski had written a book just before that called Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotonic Era. This basically uh, described technocracy. Uh, Brzezinski was a, a, a professor at the time uh, at uh, Columbia University where technocracy was originally uh, founded, the movement, uh, 1932 onward. And he clearly had access to that body of uh, thinking, and he picked up on it. His book was, um, I wouldn't say as brilliant, a lot of people thought it was, but uh, you know, basically he kind of plagiarized a lot of stuff from those people from the 1930s, but that, that aside, um, this is why David Rockefeller uh, got excited about what Brzezinski was doing, because he offered Brzez, uh, Brzezinski offered Rockefeller a chance to use this, this new system of an economic system to capture the resources of the world. That's what the Rockefellers were all about back then. They still are, for that matter. And um, <clears throat> so we saw... Uh, Brzezinski as the master strategist. Now, Rockefeller was a money guy, right? He, he was chair, chairman of uh, Ch Chase Manhattan Bank at that time and one of the um, important bankers of the world. But Brzezinski was the guy, the professor, the beauty and the beast sort of thing, um, that strategized all of this stuff that's happened since then. I can't go through the whole thing, but I could take you through what the United Nations did when it picked up this, uh, what the uh, Trilateral Commission says that was the new international economic order. Uh, they passed a resolution one year uh, going on, let's see, for about nine months after the commission was founded, 
uh, declaring that there was going to be a, a new international economic order. This same language. We see it worked out in Jena 21, uh, 20, uh, Agenda 2030, uh, the new urban agenda, all these things that have come out from the United Nations. We've seen it work it out, work being worked out in climate change, uh, alarmism, especially the, the phony science that um, has been used as real science, but it's not. Um, and even now we see these people uh, still involved in the narrative. They've never left the stage. This is one of the big points I try to be bring out for people to see. They're still on the on this, the global stage, controlling everything. Just y this week, I uh, had a story that I wrote on Technocracy.news uh, that said, uh, you know, Larry Summers of all the people is now a board member of OpenAI. He's uh, consorting now with. Uh, um, uh, with Sam Altman and, uh, you know, well, who, who's this guy, uh, Larry Summers and well, somebody will remember him from, uh, being the secretary of Tre the treasury back with, uh, Clinton. And he served as an economic, uh, an advisor for Obama administration as well. But here's a, here's a person who is bought into this narrative that we're headed towards this technotronic era, the technotronic, tech, tra, te, technotronic, as uh, Brzezinski said, but it's technocratic for us. And so all of a sudden, here's a, a member of the Trilateral Commission s gets into a position with OpenAI, which is clearly at this point the, the leader in, of, the, of the pack. He's not the only one, though. You look at Eric Schmidt, for instance, who used to be with Google and, and then Al Alphabet after that. Look at Eric Schmidt, the great friend of Henry Kissinger, by the way. They wrote two books, well, one book together, and he advised him on another one. Um, Eric Schmidt was a, a mem longtime member of the Trilateral Commission, by the way. He's not only involved at the top of the pinnacle in Washington, D.C., concerning all these things to talk about, but AI especially. Uh, he's, uh, he's advising the military, the government, every agency that you can think of. Uh, these people are still controlling the narrative. And I have to say, it, we, when we look at the World Economic Forum, for instance, which very closely was associated with the Trilateral Commission way back in the day, um, you, you look what they when they when Klaus Schwab says you're going to no, own nothing and you'll be happy forget the happy but when he said you're going to own nothing by 2030 he meant it that was a marker of the new international economic order period they want to destroy private property altogether and every sense of, sense of it and they want people to rent everything or pay pay per view or whatever Everything they consume is going to be rented by these from these people who, at that point, they think they're going to control everything. Well, this is really a bad dream on one hand. It's people just can't get it, can't see the whole picture. But I'll tell you, from the start, this whole thing was a scam. It was never real in the sense that there was substance to it, but they made it up as they went along, now they've got teeth in it with this new advanced technology. But you know what? Even that is a scam. There's no such thing as artificial intelligence. Sorry, people are humans are people. Computers are not. <laughs> but they can use it to deceive people into doing things that they would not otherwise have done. So anyway, in a nutshell, you know, this this whole thing was a scam. All of this stuff was a scam from the get-go by Brzezinski and Rockefeller and, of course, the whole crew back then. And they only had about 300 people from around the world, of which uh, only 87 were from the United States, by the way. Um, 
but the the, the game st still is is getting played out today and um that's i look at this from a macro macro point of view obviously but i've been tracking these people for 45 years i know what they've done i see what they've done along the way i've been an eyewitness to it in many cases they're still with us and they're still calling the shots and if they can they will take over any uh, any segment of this stuff that suits their purpose only yeah patrick that's excellent i'm thinking uh you know brett you and i probably are aware that real world assets rwa is a thing now and we see a massive move by blackrock and other institutions including sony uh, pictures and corporation in japan beginning to roll out and imagine what does it look like to memorialize you know uh assets in the blockchain well think about this uh the title to your house you know could be instead of recording that at the county title office like you do today it will go into a digital ledger on the blockchain it'll be an electronic item i just want to remind everybody just how bad that could be for us and not that it's uh going to happen to us before the rapture but i think that total control narrative is coming mm -hmm. so can you imagine if CBDCs roll out, which we may see, and we'll get into the financial aspects of this uh, of this part of our show today uh, a little bit later, but what happens if your ESG score or you do something silly, you jaywalk, something happens and you are punished, your credit score goes down, you're affected, and all of a sudden they turn off your house. I mean, literally. It's on the blockchain. What happens if you lose the title to your property? That's what I think they mean, Patrick, when they say you'll own nothing and be happy. I'm not thinking that people are going to voluntarily give up their things for some kind of ethereal benefit. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of wholesale theft where there's a pretense of why they must take over your asset, such as. Uh, insolvency and scott what's, payment scott what's the term that they use for this wholesale theft is, is this what they're talking about when they talk about tokenization of assets yeah. tokenization is the concept of and Britt can speak to this too but it's the concept of taking a virtual object wrapper around a physical thing in the physical world so just like you can go to the bank and stick your ATM card in there and you get physical cash out of it. It started with a digital identity with the bank, your bank account, your PIN number, et cetera, et cetera, your name. And all of a sudden you can connect digital things to real things. Well, this is kind of growing in terms of its ability to uh, influence our world today. Britt, I'm very fascinated by your <clears throat> thoughts on RWA, real world assets and blockchain and what you see sure. coming. With By blockchain. the way, Britt, let me ask you this too, because um, my people must think I have money or something because I am inundated with emails, investment emails, buy this crypto, that crypto, Bitcoin, you know, today I, somebody was telling me Bitcoin, I don't know what it's at right now. It's, what is it, $60,000 or something? Or, and it's going to go to a million. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go to a million. And it's it's having here pretty soon. And and my concern, though, too, is with, with everything tied into this blockchain, crypto is that, is it not? And then how easy is it for somebody to get control of that and get control of everything? I guess is my question to you. Okay. First, let's start with what Scott was saying with the um, real world assets. So an example of this that I just heard this past week, there's a refinery of gold. It's creating gold bars with QR codes on them. 
and they're tracking those gold bars <laughs> on the blockchain as a means of authentication. So when somebody receives it and they want to know that it's real, that, you know, this company stands behind the product, that it's not, you know, gold on the outside and on the inside is something else. You can just scan this QR code and find the specific gold bar on the blockchain. So that's an example of a real world example of what we're talking about. And they want to do this with everything. And I think along those lines, we're already in some respects at a place where we don't own anything anymore. So for instance, most people who have 401ks have large stocks available, you know, large amount of stock. But ask yourself if you own, you know, some of these index funds that are given as options in most 401k plans, when was the last time you voted your shares in, say, Apple or Microsoft? This is what gives companies like BlackRock their power because they come along and they say, well, you know, give us, you know, $100 a week and we'll invest in these 500 companies for you and you'll be diversified. But in exchange, they're controlling those shares and they're determining who's on the board of directors, what the policy of that company is. And so they're maintaining this massive control over the corporate world using other people's dollars. So, you know, it's a, and it, in a lot of ways, we've already lost that sense of ownership already. Um, in regard to blockchain, you know, I, I think a lot of these cryptos, it's just a bubble similar to what we saw with the dot-com era. A lot of people just trying to chase hash. Um, probably among those of what I've seen, that's probably the best is Bitcoin due to its decentralized nature. But again, not entirely trusting of that as we move forward and technologies come forward. At the beginning, Scott was talking about the ability to break codes. What, ha what happens when we enter the era of quantum computing? Is Bitcoin still viable? And what, what's the use case for Bitcoin? Its best use case is, is more of like a reserve asset, a store of wealth. And I'm thinking probably from, from my standpoint, it might be, well, I can carry my wealth in my head if I have to flee a country and go from one to the next versus carrying gold or cash or trying to transfer wealth electronically that could get intercepted from one bank to the next. But I think we're really entering a world where there is nowhere to flee. This isn't 80 I years agree. ago where, you know, we're in France and the Germans are invading. Let's grab what we can and go to the UK or the United States or Africa. You go from one place to the, to the next, how are you going to offload that wealth. And I think that speaks to what you're talking about, John, is what are the off ramps of this? Because Bitcoin is not something that can be spent freely necessarily anywhere you go without having to be converted to something else first. Right. And it's only if you have oppressive governments, they're going to be determining whether or not you're able to use that. So you might have it and it might give you peace of mind as you're in a jail cell somewhere. <laughs> But it's not, you, if you can't access it, what what good is it going to do you? And so really this comes down to a matter of freedom. Either we, ha either we have freedom or we lose it. In a, in a, in a world without freedom, Bitcoin, I, I don't see that it has much value. Eventually it'll have to be uh, crashed or illegal. You know, because they cannot have a competition to the centralized authority of the new world, uh, you know, financial coin, whatever that's going to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, I predict that it's all going to be declared illegal or they will manipulate it into zero value and be abandoned. You're so, talking about Bitcoin, Scott? Any crypto that competes with the one world system. Is yeah, I, I have big concerns about it too. It, it just seems mm -hmm. sort of too good be, to be controlled. But Patrick, you're pretty good with investment advice and that type of thing. What do you think of all this? I mean, we're, where's it all heading? And uh, we're, we're getting what in, do we what do we do? Yeah, we're, we're we're getting into the economic part of this 
discussion. Right. Probably a good thing because um, it it overlaps totally. There's a great uh, movie uh, called The Great Taking. It was uh, produced by David Rogers Webb. If you haven't listened to it, uh, you should. This guy is a hedge uh, fund manager. He knows what he's talking about, knows a lot about the central banks especially. And he talks about the central bank's ability to seize assets in the future. It's a fascinating uh, view. He has a book too, it's free to download. He's not making money off this, but for sure. Give give the name again, Patrick. Yes, it's uh, David Rogers Webb, W-E-B-B. And there's a video out there called The Great Taking, and I think a yeah. book by the same name as well. Exactly, exactly. If you, find, if you find the video, you can probably go to the show notes and find a link to the Exactly, to the exactly. This speaks to what we're talking about, about how assets are going to be twisted away from the public. And um, not uh, maybe all of it, but most of it. Um, I, I won't even explain what he... Uh, puts out, but it's very credible. Let me just say that. Uh, I've studied the central banks for years and years, and this guy, he knows what he's talking about. Let me, but let me throw another. Can I just uh, interrupt you for one second? Let me give you a a real world example of this, the great taking thing. I mentioned this to Britt recently in the text. Uh, I managed uh, the pastor at church many, many, I mean, talk like 30 years ago, asked me to uh, take over managing funds that a prisoner had. And uh, he's still in prison. You know, he's probably going to be in prison all of his life. <laughs> but one of the things that the prior trustee had done was purchase some stock. And I have the physical shares of stock. And I got a letter from the company that that, that sort of the intermediary that that handles the stock issues uh, you know, the custody of the stock or replacement of the lost share certificates said, hey, uh, we see you still have your real certificates. Uh, could, would you just sign this off and have it notarized and send your certificates in and then we'll have it, we'll just put it in an electronic record. So how does that fit into the great taking? The great, okay. the problem that he, that Webb brings out is that Every every uh, stock and bond and any anything else in the financial market, nobody holds these anymore. Not not maybe the few old timers do, but by and large, nobody. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Um, the problem is all of these assets, and we're talking trillions and trillions wor- uh, worldwide. All these assets are the the term is hypothetic apothecated meaning they're controlled by somebody else even though you own them you think they can be taken away from some by somebody else who has a claim to them upstream <laughs> he brings this uh this this weakness of the system out if there was a financial collapsed virtually all the securities in the world could literally be uh taken over by the central banks this is uh, this is really weird to think about but you know you say well how could they how could they do that i've got my 401k i've got I, you know, a portfolio, uh, whatever on my IRA, and I got millions of dollars in it, whatever they can do that. Yes, they can. That's what it, that's the, this is the point he's bringing out. But let me ask, let me throw to something else from a h- historic technocracy from the 1930s. This is what they're part of their definition from that era. And I want to just throw it out to you. Just see what you think about it. Uh, this was from their magazine. The technocrat from 1937. They quote. They said, "Quote." They weren't. They were, didn't hide themselves very well, did they? Uh, no. <laughs> here's what. Here's what they said. There was no place for politics, politicians, finance, or 
financiers. First off, first off, we know they want they want to dismiss all the politicians that they could. They that's coming someday. But let's just talk about the first second part. When they say there's no, no going not going to be any place for finance or financiers, what does what does that mean? In a in a debt based society, where every ha, almost everybody has a loan on their, their house, business. Uh, other assets, a car, whatever, credit cards, that sort of thing. When they say there's going to be no finance or financiers in a system, what does that mean? Well, we know that the private, the, we know that there's been a war against private property for at least 40, 50 years. We see it in the Agenda 21 document, for instance, from 1992. We see it currently by all the the assets that have been gobbled up around the world by these people like the Brock, the Black Walks of the world and uh, the United Nations, et cetera, where they, they're heaping this stuff to themselves, waiting perhaps for a, a time in the future where they can declare oh, game over for finance and financiers. Because... If there is no there is no private property, what use is finance? You see what I'm saying? If there's no private property, what are you going to find? What, what are you going to finance? You can't. I mean, this just it's just uh, uh, it's null and void. It doesn't mean anything anymore. If there's no assets that people can get a hold of that, of their own, like a house, a car, whatever, if they can't get anything, finance is dead. This is a major, major shift that's taken place in the thinking of the central banks. I tell you what, they're thinking in a different direction right now, rather than trying to grease the skids for us to make any money, for them to make all the money. This is a scary thing. But and nevertheless, I hearken back to that de definition that was clearly uh, stated by the technocrats in 1930, uh, well, 1937, no finance, no financiers in the technocratic system. What do you think? Well, I mean, so Patrick, back in the early days of technocracy, as you studied it, were, were they talking about something like this? that would be similar to a concept of, I hear bandied about a lot, universal basic income. That's Is part that, of it. Yeah, you bet. You bet. The, ab absolutely. Did, did they call it that or did they use it a, a different term? They, they called, they called it energy script and it was to be issued to every person in society equally, just like you, you UBI is today. So now I'm not so sure where we should go next. Uh, Scott, well, Britt, what do you think? Okay. Well, well, Brett, I th I'd love to hear Brett unpack the, <laughs> you know, the debt crisis. I mean, I've seen every one of his programs, uh, and kudos to you, Brett, for the research you do to bring it to us. But I'm by the looking... way, in the sh in the show notes are links to everybody's basic websites and Good. information, so you can follow up with them. Yeah, so one of the things, Britt, I'm looking at very closely right now is this idea, and it began a couple of years ago with Evergrande, the largest uh, you know, real estate holding company in China, declaring default after default after default. And here we are two, two years later, and they're still defaulting, and others are defaulting now. And the, uh, the whole basis, of, we were in awe, I think everyone was, the whole world was, 20, last 20 years, about China's ability to grow and scale. But actually, when you look at the model of what they've done, it's almost like a house of cards where it was built on speculative real estate investments for the average person. And all of a sudden, they can't drive demand. The supply and demand problem is completely messed up. And consequently, you know, there's a insolvency occurring right now that is very troubling. But what's your take on it? 
Yeah, I would say that China is pretty much a microcosm of the whole world. When you talk about it being a house of cards, the whole world financially is a house of cards right now. We have anywhere, it's estimated between two and four quadrillion dollars worth of derivatives in the world right now. That's a hard number to wrap your head around. But as, as Patrick was saying, they've not only hypothecated these assets, but rehypothecated in many cases. Mm -hmm. It's a game of musical chairs. And when the music stops, well, there, there can only be one owner. <laughs> and there's probably, depending on what you're talking about, there's going to be five, 10, 500 people blaming it. We see this in precious metals markets where they, when, when people talk about uh, spot gold and silver and gold and silver futures contracts. These are pieces of paper being traded and there's anywhere from 200 to 500 pieces of paper for every real ounce in existence. And so everybody who thinks they own that underlying asset because they own the piece of paper doesn't really own it. We see this with, we saw this with GameStop. If you remember a few years ago, made headlines that their uh, GameStop was pretty much this defunct retail store selling video games. And a bunch of people, bunch of uh, big Wall Street firms, hedge funds were shorting it because they thought it would go bankrupt. And a bunch of other people who said, you know what, uh, let's cause a short squeeze. Let's go out and buy this. Let's buy options on this and force the price to go up. Then those people who have shorted it, they'll be forced to buy it. It's called a short squeeze, and it sent it from $4 to $400 in a matter of, I don't know, three months, something like that. And this happened with a number of other stocks, and there were some lawsuits around that. When they, what came out in the lawsuits was, I, I can't remember if it was Bed Bath & Beyond or GameStop, but uh, they had 400% uh, of the float was held short, right? And you might, I'd say, well, how can four times as many shares as exist be shorted. And so that's the the fraud of the today's financial system. So it would be the yeah. equivalent of if I go out and I say, well, I'm going to buy a share of the Coca-Cola company. I'll go out, I'll purchase a share. And then uh, Patrick comes along and says, you know what? I think it's going to go down. So I'm going to short it. That means I'm going to borrow a share. So I'm going to borrow Brit's share unbeknownst to Brit, right? <laughs> I, didn't, right. I didn't know he yeah. did that. Yeah. And, and he's going to sell it. And then the hope is it, it goes down and he buys it back and, uh, you know, pockets the difference. So in the meantime, he borrows my share and he sells it to Scott. Well, I think I own that share of Coca-Cola. Scott thinks he owns the share of Coca-Cola. <laughs> There's only one share of Coca-Cola. <laughs> Who owns it? And that this hypothecated is, asset, Brit, is what I think is going to uh, blow up the system because yes. don't you think that collateralized loans, banks make you know loans to other banks and everyone's got loans to each other, but who is actually collateralizing it? And with these hypothecated you know assets, no one knows who owns Nobody it. Nobody right? knows, yeah. and so. It'll just absolutely fall, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you look at uh, so Lehman Brothers. When Lehman Brothers collapsed back in September 2008, it took 15 years for them to resolve that bankruptcy because of again, who, that who owns what, what, where is everything? No, nobody really knew. And so, as Patrick was saying, this idea of the great taking. What you really own when you purchase a stock, let's say you get online with Fidelity and you buy that share of Coca-Cola, it's called a security entitlement. And it is not first in line in the event of a credit event. Mm -hmm. Many other people have that claim to it. And of course, these laws were written and put in place by the big Wall Street financial firms and the central banks and the bankers to their benefit and not ours yeah. so that they can take this collateral and when we hear about, you know, the Great Reset and you'll own nothing, very well, this could be what they're talking about is 
as the system collapses because eventually it's it's like playing a game of Jenga. Eventually, you know, it can go on a lot longer than we think it could go on. But then eventually that last block gets pulled and the whole thing falls down and they know that day is coming. They actually and they want to be positioned to take advantage. Day. Yeah, I think right. it's yeah. all planned. Sure. Yeah. They know exactly Absolutely. what they're going to do. Yeah. Yes, I think so. And no, when, I, I when Lehman Brothers, China. We, go ahead. Uh -oh. Go ahead, Pat. Go ahead. Uh, China is a technocracy. I, I just have to say it. China is not, in my opinion, a communist dicta dictatorship today. It's exhibiting all the markers of a technocracy. It has for, been for a long time. That's not by mistake because Brzezinski was the guy who brought China in to the world stage and taught them about his tectotronic era nonsense. He didn't teach them free enterprise. He didn't teach them about capitalism. Um, nevertheless, by Time Magazine in 2000, uh, wrote an article, very well written article. And Time was one of the people, one of the organizations, media organizations who belonged to the Trilateral Commission in the early days. They wrote an article in context to um, historic technocracy that China was flat out a technocracy at that point. Nobody wants to talk about this. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish it did, but you know, people are so they're so used to looking at red, but they don't see the technocrats behind it. China today has built, like you said, Scott, they have built a, a house of cards. It's, it's hard to figure how they how they got away with it this long, but there's going to be a time when the whole thing collapses. We have, and we have to remember too, that debt based currencies all over, all over the world are just that there's not one that is not debt based. If the net, if the, the financing system goes away, all of the, uh, finance, the, the debt of uh, the currencies, the currencies all go away at the same time because they're all based on debt and debt. And China is, unfortunately for them, I suppose, they're going to play into this to a large extent. But when the dust settles on this, we, 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 we risk waking up someday with absolutely nothing except the shirt on their back, on our own back. And everybody else in the world will have a claim on the assets that we have. They think they will. In any case, it'll be chaos for sure. People trying to prove that at that point, well, who gets what? But the end of it is where if there is no debt based uh, cash or currency, if there's no debt based securities, there's no debt based economy, debt goes away, period, it just goes away, like a like a vapor. And what this le this this leads us into a blockchain world, literally, to where everything that we will consume will basically be um, pay per view, lease it as you go, whatever, but you will not be able to own whatever it is. This is why Sam Altman, by the way, is he's got this crazy company, this out scanning people's eyeballs all over the world to promote universal Worldwide. basic in income from everybody. He, 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 he says, <laughs> this is what he says. He's going to scan every eyeball in the world <laughs> to to enroll people into universal basic income because it's ba it's coming, baby. Because you you if you want to have the, the access to anything, you're going to have to be in our database. This so, is uh, beyond dystopia. Dystopia. So it's five, you know, five years ago this week, uh, I was in California, and I thought ah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a 
CLE, continuing legal education. I'm going to go out of town. So I, we were in Southern California, my in-laws. And so I thought, well, I'm going to go up to uh, San Francisco. So I went to San Francisco to a very, very expensive CLE on the Internet of Things and technology. And the whole thing five years ago, and, and these were all the tech uh, general counsel and attorneys and the law firms that represented them from New York and, you know, San Francisco and LA. And I mean, it, it was sort of the elites of that particular small set of people. And every, that's all everyone talked about was you'll, you'll rent everything. Nothing will be bought or owned as a separate asset. You'll just, You'll just rent part of it, uh, sort of like you know the scooters that you see in in a lot of urban areas laying around. A lot of times broken down and everything, but you know every, you just rent it when you need it, and then you leave it. Yeah, I I think I I'm impressed right now by the Holy Spirit guys and our audience. We need sure. to take a break for just a moment. Okay, and I just realized this is the point at the top of the show when we said we're going to be talking about some really dark things. And I think it's worth uh, just pausing for a second and to just understand that God is in control. He knows what's coming. He knows what we're going to go through as the church. He knows how this is going to impact those that we love and how it will provoke the prodigals to come back. Let's think about this, okay? We know that as these things tumble, that pastors that have been able to deflect questions about Bible prophecy and the trajectory of our redemption, our faith, really being serious about the gospel and growing disciples and uh, are, are going to be overwhelmed by the people in their congregation, that's me and you and everyone else, that will be demanding answers and the pastor is going to be on the left foot. They will not understand how to respond to the emergency demands of the moment when that comes. Call it a black swan event, you know, call it whatever you want to. Yeah. But the thing is, the Watchman community, hello, we know what's going on. I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters right now. We have been prepared for this. We know what's happening and we also know how to communicate it and our ability to discern what is happening today is growing since the, let's say the thing that happened four years ago. And so we're getting better at understanding this and we are being called to, for such a time as this, to help other brothers and sisters just coming up to speed. And what we do not want to do is Lord our knowledge over other people. We want to be kind and gentle, no kind of figure out where are they in this thing and take them just another few connect the dots, you know, ahead so that the view of what is happening and the nearness of the hour and the urgency to be about the father's business is something we can all agree we need to press on. And in my opinion, just thinking out loud, guys, I'm, I'm just tossing this on the table. But I don't know that the church is awake right now. I mean, we are distracted and there's so much nonsense going on. And I'm just waiting for the Lord's love to prevail in a way of disciplining the bride to make sure that she is ready, ready for him, ready to be raptured, ready to be, you know, the completed, I guess, the completion of our redemption to be with him forever. And so I think we look at this, not with this dread, but with this sense of expectancy, like, Lord, put me in. I am ready. I can help. Put me in, coach. Let me have those conversations in the grocery store. Let me talk to the teller. Let me talk to the people that I meet in a sports con a venue somewhere. And I think we just need to be aware of our moment as watchmen and watchwomen and how important the investment, the years and years of investment have been to get us to this moment where we can help the rest of the body of Christ to wake up and to understand. So I just want to say, this is the commercial break right now. This is a hopeful, wonderful, 
privilege. And I think, John, you're the one that said that the prophets long to see what is going to happen right now. And I would add to that Matthew 28 and think about the evangelistic implications of what we can do now as we meet people. And they're going to say to us, so listen, why are you so calm, Scott or Britt or John, Patrick? Why? And they're just going to see this sense of peace. And the Holy Spirit is going to be doing Holy Spirit things to help people be aware. Hey, you need to, these nudges from the Holy Spirit for people to come up to us and to say, why are you so peaceful with all this stuff happening? And that's our moment to speak about the love of Jesus and what he's done for us and how he changed our lives. Britt, I, I know you're passionate about this area too. Can you speak a word of encouragement to our audience as well? Sure. I think it, it, exactly what you said. It's a privilege to be here in this time. God chose each and every one of us to be here right now in this day and time. And he's given us all unique talents and abilities and perspectives and relationships with other people. And as you said, we can demonstrate the love of Christ just by the peace we have in the midst of all of this global upheaval. There's been a lot of people that know something's going on for several years now. People have been waiting for what's the next big event to happen? What's, what's going to happen next? There's this sense of anxiety that people have. And it's a perfect opportunity to explain, well, these are birth pains that we're seeing. Right. Jesus pointed to these things. And then start talking about what some of those things are. I've talked in the past about every time you go out, it, whether it's at Starbucks or Walmart, and you see somebody use cash to pay for something, say, well, enjoy that while you can, right? And they might go, what? What are you talking about? Well, you know, they're they're trying to make all get rid of cash. Everything's going to be digital. They have the central bank digital currency. Maybe they'll say, Oh, yeah, I've heard of that, or I don't know what that is. Tell me about that. Just start a conversation and tell people, you know, the Bible foretold this almost 2,000 years ago in the book of Revelation. This is what it said. And even if they dismiss you offhand and it seems like you didn't get anywhere, you've planted a seed. Right. And later on, as they see these events take place, some of those seeds are going to take root, and those people are going to say, Wow, I remember that person I encountered who said the Bible foretold all of these things. And let me go look at that. Let me look into that. But what else did the Bible foretell? Well, the Bible foretold the birth, the life, mm -hmm. death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should believe the Bible. Look at what the Bible is telling us about the times we live in today. So you can, even, even if you think you've failed... <laughs> Our, our purpose is to plant that seed, go out, engage people, talk to people. You know, it doesn't have to be some you know, preconceived you know, statement that you're reading to people. Engage people on a real level because people are curious about what's going on in the world. And again, they see these things and they know something is wrong. Something's happening, but they're not exactly sure what it is. That's our opportunity to let them know what it is so that they can see these things through the through a biblical worldview. And when they do, it'll all make sense to them. You know, um, yesterday uh, here at my house, not yesterday, two days ago, uh, we had a total eclipse. And it's well, I, I would say it's the only one I'll see in my lifetime. It's certainly only, only probably the only one I will ever see in this bodily form that I currently have. <laughs> and it. Um, it, it, it was, I, I'd seen a partial when I was a little kid, you know, like six years, five, six years old. Uh, this total eclipse thing is very different. Uh, you know, as you're leading into the eclipse, you you can't look at it. 
you've got to wear these ridiculously dark eclipse glasses that you can't see. All you can see is the a sort of a shadow of the bright sun and the moon coming across. At totality, you can look right at it. Uh, at least I did, and I don't seem to have any eye damage. Um, and it's, I, you know, I was thinking a lot about that. So the Virginia Highway Department, I think it was, maybe because they have a lot of government workers in Virginia, issued a warning that, you know, don't drive with your Eclipse glasses on. And um, because you can't see anything <laughs> with them. I mean, it, it's a black... And I, I think it's <coughs> I think it's kind of a metaphor that we've got a lot of people in life and the church kind of going through life with their eclipse glasses on. And I think it's time to sort of take them off and and see what's really going on. I and I'll say this, and I don't want to violate any confidences or anything. So I, I get emails and messages all the time. From, I watch a prophecy update that, you know, it's helped me turn back to the Lord. And I'm not sure how that happens other than that, that God's involved in it. Uh, but a lady recently wrote and her husband's not a believer. Uh, and he's part of a religion that would deny Jesus as the Messiah without giving too much information. And he's been, she said the last few months, he's been watching your prophecy updates. You know, and now he's thinking, and I hear this all the time. It's not just this one person. Thinking like, it's kind of hard to deny that Jesus is the Messiah. Because, you know, and that, that all this stuff that we hear about, it's in the Bible and it's starting to come true. So I, I think we can use that. I'm not sure how exactly, but uh, I mean, we know how it ends. But it doesn't mean that there's not some pain getting there in the interim. But um, it's, um, I don't know. I just, you know, so I think we need to take the eclipse glasses off and look at the world around us, I guess, is the takeaway from that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I, I, I would offer a personal testimony from years ago. There was a time in my life uh, when I was down on everything, I came to the point where I had had to bail from my life altogether. And I figured, well, I'm going to, I'm going to head south, <laughs> whatever that meant. And I, I was just ready to give up everything that I had in my life. Absolutely everything. The Lord will take care of me. He'll guide my steps, whatever. A wise friend stop me from doing that. He says, you know, don't do that. But the, the thought was cool, you know, good. But I learned something from that. We should be able to walk away from anything we have in our life that's holding us back at the drop of the hat. We're not be, we may not ever be called to that, but we have to recognize it may happen someday where you have to walk out of your house leave the keys where they are and go on down the road with the shirt on your back, literally. I faced death last year twice, first with heart attack, then with a stroke. It was an amazing experience. The Lord spoke to me a lot <laughs> during that period, believe me. Um, but one thing I've that I've taken away from that though that experience and from others in the past i learned there's four p's of christianity you know like there's uh reading writing and arithmetic and education right there's four p's in christianity the first one is pray always be don't be afraid to pray no, no matter what the occasion is. You see somebody that's in, under duress, go pray for them. Ask them, can I pray for you? I don't know what you're going through. I don't even know you. Can I pray with you? I've never heard anybody say, get out of my face. You know, you can't do that. The second one is preach. 
if you're not ready to give the gospel, how will people know you? So you may need to do that on a heartbeat moment. You always be ready to preach. The other thing is praise. This is something really over, overlooked a lot for, for a, lot, a lot of Christians. Are you willing to praise for whatever circumstances? And that's this is what the Bible says. Right? We should be praising in every circumstance. There's the third, third uh, first uh, three there. Praise, preach, and uh, uh, pray. The last one is perish. Many of our brothers and sisters around the world are, are called to give their life for their Messiah. And they do. We haven't been called to that. I hope we never do honestly. But I'm convinced now at this point, we need to be ready to perish at any moment. It may never happen in our country this way. But these are the things that are found foundational for our, our faith in this life. Pre preach, pray, praise, and perish. If we keep a focus on these things, I don't think the the Lord will. Well, he'll he'll lead us wherever we want to, where he wants to take us. That's my two cents. Scott, so I think that's excellent, uh, guys. It's uh, important for us to uh, be aware of the moment and uh, these prophecy updates that we do, and especially the technical things are tough to hear because we're seeing a form of chokehold that's coming. Mm -hmm. We talk about blockchain and it's interesting, uh, Brett, I remember that, uh, you know, we both are tracking what's going on with uh, uh, Carl Schwab and uh, Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum. And when he was asked about a couple years ago, what the greatest challenge to the Great Reset was, his answer surprised me. He said, governance. And you can you can see why. I mean, when they governance is part of the control narrative of what do they need to do in order to govern how people interact with all the assets and other things like that. And so there's going to be a lot of control. We just have to accept it. And uh, just a word also, uh, just me talking out loud right now to brothers and sisters, but we have to be politically responsible, yes, but we should not make an idol out of any political figure. We need to be looking for King Jesus, not a political solution right now, especially. And so I think what we need to do is let go uh, sufficiently so we can see clearly about what is going on. And, and I think that uh, it's always important to vote uh, correctly and well from a biblical worldview. But I see so many people that are continuing to, uh, you know, just they're not lifting their eyes up yet. But I think that the pressure that's coming on the church will solve for most of that. Uh, Brett, what do you think about that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we shouldn't be looking to human political figures as our savior. Jesus is our savior. And so we should be have our eyes fixed on Jesus in these times in which we live. I mean, it's there is immense trials and tribulations coming up before us. There's a difference between the tribulation. This comes up a lot when I'm talking to people about some of these things and they say, well, we won't experience that. And uh, nothing could be further from the truth because yes, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture for the tribulation, but Jesus said in this world, we'll have trials and tribulations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So this idea, and I think it's really most prevalent here in the United States and the Western world where many of us have by the standards of human history, we've lived very pampered lives, very comfortable lives. And we think, well, that'll never happen in our time. And I think, look all around you. There are Christians in North Korean prison camps right now. Mm -hmm. 
in Chinese camps right now. There's Christians being persecuted all over the world right now. There have been terrible things that have happened year after year <laughs> since the Garden of Eden. We're not promised that we're not to go through trials and tribulations. Yet this is something that I keep encountering over and over from people saying, oh, well, this won't happen. We won't see the beginnings of these things. That won't happen until after the rapture. And I think that is a bad mistake to make. We need to be living, as Patrick just said, ready to perish. And we need to, either you're all in for Jesus or you're not, right? And we need to go forward, inspect it, that we're going to be persecuted to the point of death. And we should be living our lives, sharing the good news with as many people as we can until, until our last day comes, whether it's our last breath or the rapture. You know, Britt, you're giving me chills right now because that winnowing fork that happened four years ago, you know, the Lord separated out those that are basically apostate. They had the reason they needed not to go to church anymore, not to have the pretense of faith in Christ, right? Yeah. And I see more uh, winnowing forks coming and we have to stand strong. The remnant church, you know, the really healthy part of the church is getting smaller. And it just, it means that the darkness is getting gloriously, what's the term? It's getting gloriously bright. I can't remember that gloriously saying. Gloriously dark, I think. Gloriously dark. And uh, the more yeah. pressure that comes, the more we, you know, the remnant uh, believers right now should be super pumped because we know our redemption is close. I had somebody say, just off the cuff, I can't cite who it was, but it stuck with me. When we look back from eternity into the time that we're in right now, we are all going to testify about the perfect, sovereign, orchestrated sovereignty of God to make that rapture happen at exactly the right moment, mm -hmm. down to the millisecond. We will know and acknowledge his timing. And that should give us a lot of peace, I think, that we'll be singing his praises that he delivered us from all of this nonsense here. And I, for one, cannot wait for that to happen. <laughs> I think yeah. that uh, sort of in, embedded in a lot of us is a desire to go back and look where we came from. You know, I, I catch myself every now and then on, I don't know, somehow my grandmother popped up on the internet or so. I, I think I was looking about the, Xenia tornado and it was that was the day of it was 50 years ago last week and a very powerful tornado and i was in dayton ohio that day at my grandmother's funeral so i was doing some research and i and i thought about this a lot i i think i'm i am convinced that part of the time that we are in eternity is we will trace our spiritual genealogy back to the apostles we we will we will meet everyone involved in that process and i think we will be shocked at the miracles that mm -hmm. happened again and again and again that preserved the gospel and propagated it so that it ended up with us mm -hmm. you know it's amazing to to me and i'm sure you'll, you'll agree god has no plan b there's only plan A, and we're it. <laughs> the church is it, not we individually, but, well, four of us. I don't want to even think, think we're it. But the church at large is the plan. <laughs> There's no other, no other plan that he has. And somehow through sovereignty, his will, engineered circumstances, you name it, in spite of our foibles, our screw-ups, and everything else that comes along, he somehow will bring it to a head in his perfect time to the perfect purpose. Well, let's not forget that there's a very significant dispensational change that marks the end 
of the church age and the beginning of a focus on Israel. So Israel's part of God's agenda next coming up to bat. Amen. And we we please we have to really be solid uh, and unified about uh, fighting against replacement theory and some other uh, of those uh, incorrect doctrinal positions that say that the church is Israel nowadays. No, 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 no. It's not that. So the Lord will take care of Israel and his focus will be on that. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to my brothers and, and sisters that are Jewish tribulational believers. Yeah. You know, my, my ministry focus for the last four plus years has been exclusively Tribu post tribulation ministry. And so uh, my websites, raptureKit.org, all of that stuff is designed to help come alongside people that are in desperate need of training, you know, right biblical worldview, Bibles, everything is offline, et cetera, et cetera, because that is the moment that we're in right now, as we have to be thinking about how to pass the baton of our faith to the next generation of believers. And that's one thing, this is off topic, Britt, but one day we, we should talk about what does it mean if we have digital currency and we are asked and forced and prodded into accepting digital currency and what example, here's the, the question, what example are we, the church on this side of the rapture, uh, you know, modeling? for tribulation brothers and sisters that are going to be facing the same set of oppressive controls and yet they cannot do it because it is actually the mark. And what do we do? What is our responsibility as a church to have the correct, I would say, sympathy for what they're going to be facing and the severity of the trials that they're gonna have? I just, I'm, I'm constantly thinking of what does it look like to be in the mind of a tribulation saint looking backwards into the church age. Mm. And it's just uh, very, very sobering to be thinking like that, to have that perspective. Amen. Let me, I'm going to play a video um, just because it's, and it's not necessarily somebody that I like anymore, um, but it was, uh, uh, Tucker Carlson interviewing one of these tech guys. And let me see if I can get it to play first. And then, because uh, he makes some, the tech guy, I think his name is Brian something. And he, he's he's big on biogenic or whatever, some kind of program that he's got, he's going to live forever. And he makes some interesting, and so this, these are the guys that are running this AI stuff. That's, that's what we should remember on this. Let's see if this plays. Just wonder if, as someone who grew up in a religious community, if part of you, maybe deep inside fears that when you start to say things like we can defeat death, that you won't be smoked down by the God of the universe Yeah. for assuming yeah. his role. Yeah. Do you worry about that? Uh, not in the least bit. <laughs> never, never crossed well, my mind. Well, you're either very brave or very foolish. <laughs> never crossed my mind. Really? So yeah. when you say, I can defeat death, aren't you saying I'm God? Um, I'm saying that the universe speaks in irony. That's for sure. And that the story we've told is that God created us and the actual story may be that we are going to create God. Hmm. What kind of God? Well, that question was left unanswered. Mm -hmm. uh, were you able to hear that? Yes. Yeah. What do you think? This is uh, Tower of Babel. This is Genesis 3. This is, you know, the lies of the enemy. It's told over and over and over again the same way with the same words. And it's just unbelievable that we cannot learn from the past and realize the ploy of the enemy here to deceive and to kill. Mm -hmm. John 10.10, 10, enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And it's on full display right now. And the narrative around... Uh, distracting us away from our need for Christ and for the need of our redemption is shifted off 
you know, because, well, technology will fix that. No, it won't actually. <laughs> yeah, there won't be any technology in hell, that's for sure. So it's just uh, very, very sad, very sobering, for sure. So I, I've talked a lot about it, you know, the sort of the messy inequalities that a lot of these transhumanists have. You know, we're going to, uh, Britt, you know, Britt shared me with his, his book, uh, Racing to Armageddon. I don't know if that shows up correctly. It seems like the camera's backwards. But, um, you know, I think you made the same point in your book that, you know, they are trying to mimic Christ in all of this. And it's it's very seductive and very deceptive as to what's going on. It, it's, and I think Patrick, you've written too about that. It, it's a religion. They're they're creating this, which I think is this end time religion that we're going to be. That I don't know how long we'll be here to face it, but I think certainly we're we're here. We're still here, and they're bringing it out. So uh, yeah. we have to get ready for it. So Patrick and Britt, what do you think? Yeah, let me let me point out that the 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 Babel experience was about technology it would was used to deceive the people into the fact that they could build a tower into heaven they never did that before the way they used to build before that was with rocks and mud basically you can't build any structure with that for sure when the when it was introduced that you could use cut stones glued them together with tar you can build almost anything as high as you want even a strong wind will make it flex whatever this might this must have just completely blown the people away yet the devil used that technology to deceive everybody that we can do this for people we can do this just get with it join us this is exactly what's happening today. You can just see this, this whole base of technology today is no more revolutionary than, than the concept of using cut stones and tar to build the original Tower of Babel. Yeah, I, th I think we also go back to that story and we look at what God said when he scattered the people. He said that nothing will be impossible for them. And we mm -hmm. see these things being talked about now. You know, 2 Thessalonians 2.11 says that God will send them strong delusion that they will believe the great lie. I believe that's the lie from the Garden of Eden, that you will be like God. And that's what we see people in Silicon Valley and this transhumanist community saying openly. They, they don't hide it. They say, we are going to be God's. Ray Kurzweil said, we will expand out into the universe and infuse the universe with our spirit of intelligence and love and beauty, assuming <laughs> that the universe isn't already infused with all of those things. It puts, you know, the humanity in direct physical conflict with God, not just spiritual conflict with God. And I think that's where all of this is headed. You look at all of these promises of the transhumanist agenda, all of the things that they supposedly look forward to. Scott pointed out all these things are available through Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. but they're trying to climb over the sheepfold. They don't want to enter through the gate. Mm -hmm. And there is only one path to achieving all those things that they say that they want and know that that is the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross as forgiveness for our sins. They can talk all they want about all these things that technology will enable and they can counterfeit a lot of the miracles of Jesus, but they cannot forgive sin. And sin is the root cause of all of these problems. It's only solved by Jesus on the cross dying for our sins, paying our penalty, standing in our place so that we can be reconciled with God. There's no other way around it. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
So people like this guest on Tucker's show that think that I'm not worried about that, I'm going to be able to do that, are sadly mistaken. And we need to be spreading the truth and sharing the truth with as many people as we can. Amen. Well, what we could go on and on and on. And I think maybe this would be a good time. I, I don't want to take away from Britt's great conclusion. Uh, we really appreciate you listening. I think we're going to wrap it up now. By the way, Tom Hughes could not join us tonight because of travel. Uh, but hopefully in the next time, we hope to do this again sometime in the near future because I think there will be plenty to talk about. So maybe I should, could go back to each one of uh, these uh, great gentlemen and ask them to kind of give us some wrap-up thoughts uh, and maybe a little advice to go with it. I saw a comment just now that uh, struck a chord. We should address it. Uh, I, I made a comment about the Winnowing Fork going through the church and that people are falling away. Let's make a distinction. Uh, those that are saved, according to John 3, being born again, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, uh, in having the Spirit of God in them, a miraculous transformation that occurs spiritually. Uh, they could have walked away from church during those years, and they're still believers. I just want to make that very clear. So, uh, but a lot of people that had cultural Christianity that identified uh, as uh, Christian because they're Americans, you know what I'm saying? The historical uh, habits of their family past, their genealogy, those, uh, you know, must come to faith and we have to uh, do all we can to help support them. So I appreciate the comment to get a clarification in there. Uh, so thank you for that. Well, I think it goes back to some of the great debates among Calvinists and others, you know, that some people think that somebody could actually, I, I, I don't think, I don't know anybody that thinks this way, could send their way out of their salvation. Uh, but they could, you know, some say we could walk away from it. Uh, and, you know, Calvinists, you know, and so the, the debate becomes, were they saved or not saved? The, the ultimate conclusion with these people is they need to be saved. That's a, you know, if they're living an apostate life and that type of thing. So we need to, you know, it's a very difficult as there's been probably a lot of books and uh, internet fights about that particular <laughs> issue. So maybe we'll leave that go, but Scott, uh, give us your wrap up thoughts here. Yeah, I think this has been an excellent, we, we covered, 25% of our topics today, just so everyone knows. <laughs> so thank you for that. I hope that you saw the evidence and uh, of our, you know, trying to be encouraging at the, at the same time, still giving meaningful updates on technology and what we see coming. We've talked about some of the key words to pay attention to and uh, advice and counsel on what you know, we want to be aware of and what we should avoid. I'm thinking right now about the AIs that are listening to our every conversation, that that type of conversation is important. And one thing I would just plead with our audience and everyone listening right now, uh, that we must continue to uh, do our role as watchmen and watchwomen. So we have a job to do. We've been appointed for this time and we have a responsibility, which is very severe in Ezekiel uh, 33, chapter three and 33 to watch and warn. And our job is not done. Here's the admonition. Just because we get raptured, our job as watchmen and watchwomen continues to leave the right bread crumbs of our faith into that next generation. So letters and Bibles, you know, whatever uh, CDs and things, materials, books, boxes that you have in your pantry to give to the next generation when we're gone. All of that matters. Everything will be used. The, the Bible says that the word will not return void. So if you have the word of God on something, it's going to be used by the Lord. So that's how I'll wrap. Britt? Yeah, I want to build on a little bit more on what Scott was saying. You know, uh, 
Dr. David Jeremiah says, just because you're standing in a garage doesn't mean you're a car, right? And just because you're in a church doesn't make you a Christian. And so I think people put a whole lot of thought into planning their lives, where they're going to go to college, what they're going to do with their life, what vacation they're going to take, how they're going to save for retirement, what they're going to do. Very few people think about what happens when I leave this world, what happens when I die. Most of the people that haven't thought about those things aren't thinking about the rapture. So they're, they, but they look around and they see, well, the people that came before me died, yet they won't put thought into what happens after that. And if you're one of those people that's happening to be watching this right now, I would ask you, you know, make sure the most important thing you can do in your life is to make sure that you have a saving grace relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. for The reasons we talked about earlier, but I would encourage you, you know, ask yourself that question, probe your heart, make sure that you have that relationship. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know me and I know them. Ask yourself, do you know the voice of Jesus? Do you know him? Does he know you? That is the most important question that any of us can answer. All, all the rest of what we talked about today is irrelevant mm -hmm. if we don't know the answer to that question. Hmm. Amen. Patrick? Oh, boy. <clears throat> you know, for all those Christians who have been orphaned by their churches. There's so many people, I know many people who just don't, they have no, no church in their uh, community anymore that they can go to. And they're, they're isolated. They're out there, they're still believers, totally. Some of, some, some of the strongest believers I know, actually. But they have no fellowship because they have no church. That's one of the, the sad um, things that take away, I guess, from COVID. Uh, for those people, they need to get it into fellowship of some type, even if it's your, in your kitchen with a few friends. We need to be in touch with people right now. It's so, so important to be connected to real people, not to social media, forget that, <laughs> to be, be con connected to real people. Now, for instance, I know John, I, for instance, I met him in person. And, but you know, meeting like this is not the same as touching him or shaking the hand, or whatever, you need to be in touch with real people. The other thing I would say that, as Christians, our plumb line descends from God himself on how we should live. We should not, we should be conscious of that plumb line every step of the way from here on. Don't deviate from the left or the right. If you know something is right, do it. If you, if you know something is wrong, don't do that. <laughs> and if you can't figure out what's in the middle, you have the Holy Spirit and prayer to guide you. And of course, the word of God as well. But don't deviate from this from here on, if you can. So I know the pressures of life, they, they come on us and they really screw us up time, sometimes. But that's that should be our goal. If you find yourself somewhere other, other than that, get back quickly. <laughs> that's all I could say. Because that's your safe zone. Prevail and overcome. Yes. Key words we need to remember. Good word, Patrick. Well, good thoughts. So we're going to wrap up with prayer here in just a moment, Brett. I'm going to ask you to do that before that. Uh, one of my goals in doing these round tables was that I've been privileged to speak at a number of conferences. And uh, Scott, as you know, and Patrick, as well, and, well, all you guys know, that sometimes the best conversations at the prophecy conference take place back in the green room with the speakers. And so one of my goals is to kind of bring 
that experience so that everybody can kind of at least listen in on the conversation. And it's not scripted, doesn't always go in a linear fashion. There's no PowerPoint presentation to follow or get your slides out of order or anything like that. But um, so that, that's that been the goal of this. Uh, we hope to continue those. Uh, you can follow us here at Fellowship Bible Chapel. You can follow all the guys. There are links to their websites, news channels, websites, whatever, in the show notes. Um, I really wanted to talk about Israel tonight because uh, that's really heavy on my heart. Uh, but we don't have time to do that. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to be on with Kurt Reed tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. I think that's live on his YouTube channel. And we're going to talk about Israel because there's a lot going on there. So I really appreciate everybody listening. Uh, uh, trust that the quality of everything was was uh, up to snuff this time. Um, and we hope to uh, do this in the future. Pray for all of us. Uh, Britt puts up stuff every day. I don't know how he does it. Scott does stuff. I know Scott does a Bible study too. And, um, and Patrick has a great, uh, website, Substack, uh, is what is it, the quickening report, right? Yes. The quickening report. Uh, highly recommend it. Follow them. Uh, you'll get a lot of information, um, and, and, but pray for us because I'm, uh, I feel inundated by the, by the tyranny of the urgent because there's so much going on. And so I've, I've been pretty tired the last couple of weeks. It's been hard for me to, <laughs> uh, to function a couple of days. So pray for all of us. We'll be in good health and, um, the Lord will watch over us and allow us to continue to do what we think the Lord has called us to do. So Britt, I'm going to ask you to close us in prayer and then we'll uh, turn off the stream. Okay. Sure. Lord, we just thank you for bringing us together tonight to be able to do this live stream. And we pray that you will use it to your glory, We hope that you will reach people and that this message has helped give comfort to many people in these tumultuous times and with what we see coming. I pray that it helps people to fix their eyes on you, put their trust in you, put their faith in you, knowing that you've already won the victory, Lord. And so we just thank you for this time and for everyone who will be able to see this. And Lord, we just, everything in you, is in your name. We, we love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you at the next roundtable. Thanks. Good night.